I'm Rosemary Morton and welcome to a snowy day here in Hampshire and welcome to The Real Flower Company which is where we are today and also a huge welcome to all of you watching from Flowers from the Farm. We're standing in, in 12 acres of Hampshire Downland where we're growing about 150 different flowers and foliages, primarily for um, obviously the cut flower industry, but we're making bouquets to send out all around the country. But we're also still very much supplying florists all around the country from Scotland to Cornwall with you know, your everyday needs. So it could be literally foliages or it could be roses, you know, whatever people want, that's, that's what we'll send out. I'm married to a farmer, an arable farmer, and the arable is great, but you always, you're always in farming looking at other things to do. We went through everything. We went through um, angora goats, we went through ostriches, we had a look at tilapia fish, <laughs> and every time I came back with yet another harebrained idea, my husband, who's the real business acumen, and has got, well, he's got the, you know, the feet on the ground, and I had a lot of friends in the flower world, and um, they used to take me into Covent Garden and I'd just be feeling there was something lacking there. You know, there was beauty all around as we, you know, just talking about flowers, but, but there was something lacking. And I realised that it was, there wasn't really any scent. And so I can remember coming back one day and saying to um, Matthew, my husband, you know, I think I finally cracked it. I think I know what we need to be doing. And he looked at me and sort of rolled his eyes to the heavens and said, oh God, what's she going to come up with now? And I said, we're going to grow scented garden roses. My mother was a brilliant, or still is, a brilliant horticulturist, as was her mother. And we were army, and I grew up being moved around all over the world. But one thing that always stuck in my brain was the fact that we always had flowers around us. And it didn't matter whether we were in a, um, you know, in a sort of rented army accommodation in the middle of Malaya or where we were. We always had something from the UK with us and it was scent that actually stuck in my, my mind. And I can remember, as I say, harking back to my mother's gardens and my grandmother's and thinking, well, why can't we have scented garden roses? And that's where the whole idea started. I think flowers are something so important to us as a human race. The vision of a flower, it's so uplifting and it's been really brought home. I mean, it has done for the 25 years I've been doing it, but I think specifically this year has really brought it to a head because, you know, with the dreaded COVID that we've all been living with, um, the fact that we're sending flowers to people and sending flowers to people who are in a really, really bad way um, or who are you know, struggling emotionally or whatever else, and the messages that we've been getting about flowers and how uplifting they've been, etc., has been, it's enough to actually make me almost choke up. We started in my mother-in-law's garden um, with uh, about 60 rose bushes and a few scabious plants and I must tell you actually because it's a very funny story about scabious because I bought some down from Norfolk and a lovely guy with a great Norfolk accent appeared with these scabious plants and said here you are and um, you know good luck with them and I'll see you next year. I went god you're really positive that's great. He said no 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 they'll all be dead by next year you'll need some more. <laughs> And that was the sort of start of, you know, me learning on the job, so to speak. And so we went from 60 roses that year to doubling it every year. And the big jump was going from the garden to a little paddock. And then we went, I stole one of my husband's um, best wheat fields on the top of the farm. And we put in about 8,000 roses. And that was back in the, um, about the 90s, end of the 90s. And we're now sort of standing in 12 acres of, of a paddock. Yeah, we've gone from, well, the, you know, 60 roses to about 30,000 roses that we're growing today. I'm totally self-trained. So, you know, I have learnt on the job and I never got any, I could never get any advice from anybody. Um, I've got one or two mentors, um, one of whom's still alive today, which is Philip Harkness of Harkness Roses, who's been a huge support. Um, it's, you know, I'm literally, nobody really had done what we were doing. So to get that advice, yes, you've got the Dutch who are brilliant at growing, but to actually work out how to cut 
roses with some decent length on them, let alone how to stop them from getting every disease under the sun, um, you know, it's, is, is challenging. And I think it's taken 25 years and I'm still learning on the job. <laughs> you know, I still make huge mistakes, um, but hopefully learn as I go along and, and improve as I go along. When we first had enough roses, and it took two or three years to get some roses, let alone the scabious I mentioned earlier, I drove up to London at two o'clock in the morning in, in my husband's Land Rover um, with little window boxes, because that's the length of the roses I could get, into Covent Garden. And um, they looked at me as though I was, you know, something from out of space. I think they thought I was completely mental. They sort of, you know, they really genuinely did think I was mental. But... It was like walking in there and being a kind of Pied Piper and, you know, I'd have florists kind of going, where are you going with those roses? Because they could smell them. You know, we grow a really scented, very difficult rose called Margaret Merrill. And um, she's always been our sort of, I don't know, our, our signature, I suppose, rose, but the, probably the most difficult you can grow. And the scent of her going into Covent Garden was phenomenal. They, they didn't really take me that seriously. I think they thought there was, you know, some farmer's wife playing at, at growing and I wouldn't be around that long. So after a couple of years, I think we tried there. Um, we said, right, well, we're going straight to the florist. So I would then carry on at three o'clock in the morning, driving around London, dropping buckets of roses, etc., on various florists. So when I started, we were supplying people like Kenneth Turner, Poolbrook and Gould, Moisey Stevens, um, all the uh, Paula Pryke, you know, all those sort of top, top florists. So I'd built up good relationships with lots of florists in London who we would deliver to. And then for the winter, there'd be nothing. So it was quite a sort of, you know, six month business, which actually in retrospect probably would have been quite sensible to stick there. But no, 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 no lunatic here decides to carry on. And so we got involved in Kenya um, and we now have, well, we, we in about the end of the 90s, we got a sister farm called um, Tambuzi, which is um, owned by a great, what, what have become great mates, Tim and Maggie Hobbs. And they were crazy enough to decide that they would like to try and grow garden roses for us as well. And that was the start of an all year round business. And we were adamant that if we did that, that we would, could, we would do it as sustainably as we possibly can, which I know you're probably all going, oh, for goodness sake, you know, that's air miles and this, that and the other. But it's actually been proven that it's better to bring flowers in from Kenya than it is to grow them under light and heat in Holland. And I think, I don't, I, I'm so proud of our um, sister farm in Kenya. The Hobbses have for, you know, 20 odd years created the most amazing business. And from the 3,000 roses that we took out and planted, they had... They, I think they, they were employing about two or three people on the farm initially, and they're now employing about four or 500 people, all of whom have got about eight dependents back at home. And they are great, not just that, so they're employing all these people. They've got schools going, they've got, you know, they've improved the roads, they've improved the sanitation, they've got the most amazing um, sort of reservoir with fresh water in it that all the, these guys can use. Um, and it's just been, it's become a serious community, which I think is fantastic. But... Not just that, I think the, what's really important is the fact that they are the first Kenyan farm to go carbon neutral. And that is quite an achievement. This has not been easy and it still isn't easy. And I can remember it sort of taking over when once the children had gone to bed, all we would talk about was how we were going to improve, how we were going to actually get through another year, convince the bank manager we were worth backing for another year, because it was flipping hard. I mean, initially when we were just supplying florists, um, we had, we didn't, uh, they didn't have credit cards. So, you know, nobody had a credit card, really. Sounds like I was sort of back in the dark ages, but it's amazing how technology's moved on so quickly. So we had, you know, we were owed a lot of money, which was, for starters, was tricky. So, you know, we were having to sort of try and get money out of people and carry on supplying them. And just, you know, like Covent Garden. I mean, Covent Garden has changed so much over the years. They've, you know, they totally get where we are now. But it was really just knocking on people's doors. And you've got to have the right character to be able to do it. And I think if, if you believe in yourself and you believe in what, what you're doing and you believe in what is right and what you really, you know, what, what's important in life, it doesn't matter whether you've got a window box and a, and a few basil plants and a bit of rosemary or, or what it is, you know, if that suits you and you can, you, can, you can make something out of that, that's what it's all about. It's about 
taking an opportunity and making the best of it. I mean, you could say, well, yes, gosh, you, you've got a farm and, you know, uh, it, was, it was easy for you. It, it's never been easy. It really hasn't. And I think, you know, we, we've got rubbish soil here for growing what we're growing. It's, it's really, and most people would look at the soil we've got and say, what are you doing? <laughs> but I think I've just got that. We're going to find a way of doing this. And it ain't going to be easy, but we're going to get around it. And I think it's a case of actually having courage in your convictions and actually really saying, why am I doing what I'm doing? What am I trying to get out of it? And making sure that if you go into this business, it, you know, you know what you want to get out of it. I think that's really important. I think you know, for anybody who's going into this type of business or anyone who wants to start being you know, a flower farmer or a retailer and whatever else you want to do. I think the, the first important thing is to, is to ask yourself why you're doing it. Are you going into this because you like growing? Is it particularly marigolds that click your switch? Or, you know, is it, is it herbs or are you growing it for food? Or what are you doing and what do you want to get out of it? And, and I think it's a case of actually balancing. You know, if you've got a young family and you haven't got much time, don't be too ambitious because you're just going to get frustrated and upset. Um, I mean, I can't tell you how stupid I was when I started because, you know, I had literally just had my first um, b baby. And I can remember my husband turning around to me and saying, are you sure this is a good idea? You know, you are literally just having a baby. We can't afford any help. Are you completely crazy? And I go, no, 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 it's just to be part time. It won't, it, won't, it won't be very much. I've been full time for many, many years and I've had to juggle, you know, children and, you know, re up the school ring up saying uh Rosby, are you coming to collect whoever it is and I go yeah yeah I'm on my way I'm on my way sorry sorry you know and so you've got to be absolutely certain you know why you're doing what you're doing and if you're if you're doing it to sort of sell locally great have you actually explored your local market do you know there's a market for what you're doing because there's nothing more soul destroying than growing a load of flowers and then not having any, anywhere to sell them different matter if you're just doing it because you like growing that's fine but decide what you're doing and why you're doing it and what you want to get out of it when you're in a business like like we're in you're always having to you know get it get your name out there and um we we've been at chelsea flower show for the past probably 15 16 years i should imagine and it's always a challenge. I'm actually hopeless because I never know who anybody is. So press day is a disaster because luckily I'm, I'm there with somebody who's considerably younger than me who goes, Rosemary, quit that such and such. I go, who? Oh, just, just get on with it. And I, so I don't know who I'm talking to. Chris Evans was a different one in, in particular though because I could see him being filmed um, at the top of the sort of the main, main avenue in Chelsea. And I just happened to have, as you do, a great big, bouquet of our sweet peas that we grow down at Chichester and I just gathered this huge bouquet and stuffed it in one of our hat boxes and just barged my way up to the front of Chris Evans who was doing his interview with whoever he was doing and I don't know what got into me I literally just you know battered my way in a very peaceful fashion through the crowds and this let me go I said I'm sorry I've got flowers to deliver and they let me go and I just deposited this box on Chris Evans he just went Oh, wow. Um, and that was great. And it was a it was a great shot. And I think that's, you know, it's just having that drive to actually make sure that people people see your flowers. It's working out, you know, just on a, a few lines as to what is really important about your brand and then working out where you're going to go with it. Because if it's if it's um, organic, then there'll be, you know, you'll head down the kind of organic social media route. If it's you know, if it's growing flowers for, for local markets, that's another route. So there's, but there's so many different avenues to get, to get the word out. But I think it's really important to know what your brand is and what your, where your strengths are. As, as I stand here today, the challenges are huge. One of the issues we have here, um, which gives us huge challenges, obviously, is the weather. I mean, our climate is, is pretty tricky. Um, and I think, you know, certainly growing where we're growing, yes, we've got polytunnels to act as an umbrella and all the rest of it, but that comes with, loads of issues with disease because you've got then got an umbrella and you're you know you've got things like mildew and black sport and all the other things that, that come in um, so it's i think i would again just be very careful about what you want to grow and why you're growing it and possibly it's from a starting point of view start with annuals and go reasonably simple and then build it up from there 
Um, there's a lot of positives, but the challenges are, are very big. Obviously, we've got Brexit, which is, you know, is big across the board, <laughs> to say the least. Um, and you've got issues with, with COVID going on. Um, you know, we had a classic the other day just before Christmas when somebody suddenly said, we're not, we're not delivering into tier four. And we had about, I don't know, how many boxes, 100 boxes or something to go into, you know, what was then tier four before everything locked down. And you constantly get these challenges and you're having to try and work out your way around them. I mean, it's, it, there's, there's always something going on. And at the moment, it's things like things being held up at customs, you know, because of, because of the Brexit situation. But I think it makes it all the more important to try and try and get as local as you can in the hope that, you know, that's, that's going to be simple. Um, I think with the whole COVID issue there, you've, you've, got, you've got two things going on. You've had massive challenges, but you've also got the appreciation of people actually getting flowers. And I think that's been phenomenal, actually. At the same time, I can't tell you how extraordinary human nature is, because for everyone who's rung up and said, oh, thank you so much, you've really made our day, you then get somebody who said, I was expecting flowers to be delivered at 10 o'clock this morning, and they haven't arrived, and it's now midday, and you go, have you looked out of the window, madam? Have you seen what's going on in the world? <laughs> Do you think that possibly two hours later might not be a major issue? So, you know, you've constantly got that going on. You are going to get setbacks. You are going to have failed crops. The mice are going to eat your flipping tubers, you know, or scabious or whatever else it is. You know, the weevil is going to get in there and, um, and aphids are going to, are going to munch through your, your roses. It never stands still. And nature is a funny thing. And, you know, for every downer and every, you know, I mean, I have a con constant battle with my husband with his um, cereal crops out there because when he, when he cuts the rape, um, all the thrips, little tiny insects from the rape, decide, oh, good, let's go over to Rosemary's Roses now and all the rest of the things we got over there are a pollen beetle rather than threats. And they all come flooding in here and suddenly all our beautiful tight budded roses have all been munched by pollen beetle. So there's a constant challenge going on. It's really important to, to work out why you want to get into this business. You know, and don't be too romantic about it, for goodness sake. I think actually really understand the challenges that, that are out there with, with our climate and work out whether you can cope with those, whether you want to cope with those and what you're trying to do. Um, I've, there's, there's a lot of easier ways of, of making money, but t you'll get huge satisfaction um, and a lot of happiness, you know, out of producing flowers with character. I'm often asked what I would do differently 25 years back. Um, you know, would you do what you're doing now? And... I, in some ways, I don't think I'd change it. Obviously, I'd have knowledge on my side. I think I probably might have just got to move on as far as, you know, working out how to do the retail side or whatever else quicker. But as far as what we're growing, I don't think so, because I think my mission is still the same. It's bringing flowers with, with character, the sort of garden look, the just pick from the garden look to them, to the public. I mean, when I look back over the past 25 years, you know, all the hard sort of, work and headaches and all the rest of it that I've, I've had along the way. I think it all really does pale into insignificance when you see where, where it's got today and the people I've met and the impact that we're, that we're having. And all those, you know, thousand flower farmers who, who, you know, all of you lot who are out there now today, hopefully who are inspired and loving what they're doing. And that to me is, is, is great. And to be able to produce, you know, the flowers that we're producing um, and the people that we're you know, that we're meeting along the way is just, is just fantastic. I would say I have got such pleasure out of what we are doing, because for specifically what we touched on earlier in that people love flowers and if people get our flowers. I mean, I've had one of the, one of the places we've um, sold at and we still do is, is London farmers markets. So I've been there at sort of, I don't know, six o'clock in the morning, you know, laying out at the roses and I get people walking past who look as though the end of the world is nigh and they're all we're all doomed and I go hey on a minute just smell these roses and I'll put a Margaret Merrill or something in front of their noses and their faces just light up and that to me is is all the gratification I need it really is because suddenly somebody who looked as though life was just not worth living has suddenly gone wow and you know really smiling although somebody who rings up and says you know you made my day I've just you know I've just my dad's funeral was last week and it was awful because you know nobody could be there and this that and the other your flowers really made it for us and that sort of thing is just so important mm -hmm.